Hey guys, my name is Josh. And I'm Kez. And sadly, this is our final episode on the Fruit of the Spirit. Ah, it's been so real, it's been emotional, and also it's been lots of fun. It has been a lot of fun. Josh versus Karen. Fight. Fight. It is winner takes all in this final challenge. We have a brick and we have two kiwis and basically we have to protect our kiwis and the kiwi that is the least destroyed after the brick falls from here is the winner. Good luck Kez, you're going to need it. Oh. Let's do this. created our protection for our kiwis yep. and now it's time to see if they work. <laughs> Hasta la vista baby. Yes! That looks like it survived. <laughs> Goodbye Karen. <laughs> okay, we're going to unveil the kiwis and see whose is the most destroyed. Okay. I've got a feeling mine is okay. It's not looking good for you. Can't even get it out. That is one intact kiwi. Yeah, that's a cat too. <laughs> Champion! We win. Oh, wait, no. Okay, fair enough. Winner! Recently, I started writing my wedding vows and it made me realize how serious faithfulness is. It's not as simple as a pinky promise or best friend forever bracelets. Faithfulness is about commitment. I'm choosing to be committed to this person for the rest of my life, no matter what happens. For better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish till death us do part. Through good times and bad times, I'm choosing to love him. I'm choosing to be faithful to him. And what does faithfulness look like beyond marriage? What does the Bible have to say about faithfulness? There are so many stories in the Bible of faithfulness, from Abraham and Sarah waiting for a child for years and years, to Job remaining faithful to God despite losing everything he had. But the story we're going to look at today is of three men called Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The king at the time, Nebuchadnezzar, wanted his people to worship him over any of their gods. So he created a gold statue of himself for people to worship. The king sent this order out. Nations and people of every language, this is what you are commanded to do. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship immediately will be thrown into a blazing furnace. These three men refused to bow down to the gold idol of Nebuchadnezzar and he ordered for them to be thrown into the furnace. Here we see a remarkable display of faithfulness. Instead of giving in to social pressures, they replied this. King Nebuchadnezzar, we don't need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we're thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. How awesome is that? These three men had the faith to believe that God would rescue them from being consumed by the fire. And after they came out of the fire, they were completely unharmed. This was despite the fire being seven times hotter than usual. It was so hot, it killed the guards outside the furnace. So how do we remain faithful? It can be so hard at times, especially when we are faced with extreme adversity, just like Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego face certain death in the furnace. 
It's not easy at all. Sometimes all we want to do is just give up and go to bed. One of the reasons we should be faithful is because God is also faithful. The simple fact that God is faithful can motivate us to also be faithful. It's similar to that old saying that Jesus said, treat others as you wish to be treated. God is faithful to us, so the least we could do is be faithful in return. My favourite thing about Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego is that they were not alone in the fire. When they showed faithfulness to God and it looked like they were about to pay dearly for it, God showed up. The king threw three bound men into the fire, but then it says this, look, Nebuchadnezzar shouted, I see four men unbound walking around in the fire unharmed. And the fourth looks like the son of God. The Lord was with them in the fire, protecting them. Just like those three guys, Jesus is with us in the fire too. God is so much more faithful to us than we could ever be. We are human, we mess up time and time again. But throughout all of this, God's love never fails. He is the everlasting Father. He is the one who will never let us down in the chaos of life. When we draw close to God, He draws close to us. He will never leave you or forsake you. So go and show this faithfulness to a world of instability and disloyalty. Does anyone really struggle not to eat a whole packet of biscuits or to have the recommended serving of chocolate? <laughs> it's so hard sometimes to have self-control, although the suggested serving's way too small, so yeah. you can't really blame me, Kez. I agree. What I'm trying to say is that sometimes it can be really hard to have self-control, especially in the times where it's for something we really desire like that chocolate. We're going to look at a man in the Bible called David, who is the second king of Israel. There are two stories we're going to look at today from his life. The first one where he failed to have self-control and the second one where he did have self-control and the consequences of both situations. The time when David didn't have self-control is found in 2 Samuel 11. To summarise, David was walking on the roof of his palace one evening and while he was up there he saw this beautiful woman called Bathsheba. She was having a bath on her roof, bit weird. David sent one of his servants to find out who she was and then he sent someone to get her. David lacked self-control and slept with Bathsheba, who became pregnant. This was an awful situation because both David and Bathsheba were married and David was the king. So if people found out what he did, his reputation would be seriously damaged. So to try and cover up his wrongdoing, David had Uriah, Bathsheba's husband, killed so he could then marry her. Some of the consequences that David faced as a result of this sin included Bathsheba's child dying, his other children abusing and killing each other, his children betraying him, and conflict within his nation. David's lack of self-control caused all of these bad things to happen. The time when David had good self-control came early in his life, before he was the king. The king at the time, who was called Saul, had David as a servant to play some music for him. When the Israelites faced the Philistines, a giant man called Goliath challenged them. He said, send a warrior and face me. David decided to step up and fight the giant and armed only with a slingshot and some small stones, he managed to defeat Goliath. After this, David rose the ranks within the army to army commander, but Saul became scared of David because the Lord was with him, but not with Saul. So he tried to kill David, forcing him to flee. While on the run, David and his men were hiding in a cave and Saul went in to relieve himself, and David had the opportunity to kill Saul. Instead, he cut the corner of Saul's robe off and spared his life because of his great self-control. He said this, the Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lay a hand on him, for he is the anointed of the Lord. This was despite the men with David encouraging him to kill Saul. We see later in the story that because of his great self-control and sparing Saul's life, David was blessed by the Lord. He won battles, he was protected, and eventually became king. One way we can have good self-control like David here is through accountability. For example, I might say to you, Kez, I'm going to go for a run three times this week. Next time you see me, you could ask me, oh, how were your three runs last week? Having accountability with someone massively helps with self-control. 
As we can see from these two stories, there is a conflict between what God wants for our lives and what we want for our lives. Paul summarizes this conflict in his letter to the Galatians. So I say, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you're not under the law. If we choose to follow our fleshly desires, we'll end up like David after he slept with Bathsheba. The sin that resulted from his lack of self-control separated David from God and led to all those bad things mentioned previously. However, if we choose to walk in step with the spirit and have the self-control to say no to the flesh, then we will produce the fruit of the spirit from abiding with God, which helps us to live lives of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. And that's it, that's the end of this Limitless TV series. We hope you've learned all about what the fruit of the Spirit are and how you can apply and live out those fruit. It's been an absolute pleasure to have this conversation with you. Josh, could you pray for us? Of course. Yeah, Father, I just thank you for the, the transformative power of your Holy Spirit. I pray that we can, by getting closer to you, we can really begin to develop these fruit and show those characteristics that you showed. And I help us to have that self-control in those times where we face temptations. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. See Bye. you all soon.